Hello, my name is Ian McCollin. This is the overview of module 3A. Now, this module is going to look at uh, various aspects of eczema, including hand dermatitis and a little bit on contact dermatitis as well. Now, I appreciate that uh, this is a big topic. Um, I'm going to choose certain uh, aspects of, uh, of this uh, topic as I go through them, and we'll go over them on the on the evening of the webinar itself. What do I think you should try and concentrate on? Certainly look at atopic dermatitis and look at the different ways it presents in different age groups. Um, know a little bit about atopic dermatitis and uh, some other genetic disorders where atopic dermatitis is a prominent condition, such as the Wiscott uh, Aldridge syndrome or Job syndrome. Know a little bit about hand dermatitis. Hand dermatitis is a very common presentation of atopic uh, dermatitis. In fact, it's said that I think about 60% of patients who have uh, atopic dermatitis when they're young will develop ha uh, hand dermatitis uh, of significance at some point in their life. So, uh, knowing a little bit about hand dermatitis, I think, is important. Um, there's a particularly good lecture given here by Joe Fowler once at a Hawaii dermatology meeting, looking at this whole topic of hand dermatitis. And it goes on to talk a little bit about um, more aggressive therapies in hand dermatitis. And I hope certainly to cover those in the webinar itself. And that's where you're talking about um, using hand poover, uh, perhaps using intramuscular uh, kenacort every four to six weeks where you're uh, considering drugs such as uh, cyclosporin or methotrexate. Uh, Joe really uh, likes using methotrexate and I've certainly used it as well. Um, it's a drug that certainly is quite predictable in its effects in hand dermatitis and it's probably much safer for patients than um, putting them on oral steroids. But remember, the management of chronic hand dermatitis means optimizing a whole variety of factors, and we'll go over that when we uh, do the webinar itself. Pomphilix eczema, not all pomphilix eczema is allergic. Remember, pomphilix eczema can have a variety of causes. It can be of an underlying atopic uh, basis. It can be secondary to fungal infection of the feet. It can be stress-induced can be an irritant uh, contact dermatitis as well as allergic contact dermatitis. So there are a variety of uh, causes of pomphilix eczema. And we'll hope to have a little look at, uh, at that as well. Numular eczema is something I think you should look up. It's more common in the elderly with dry skin and it's more common on the lower legs and particularly on the back rather than on the anterior chest. Very often a secondary infection with it. You've certainly got to look at the drugs uh, that they're on, particularly cholesterol-lowering drugs and beta blockers, uh, because in my experience these certainly um, precipitate numular eczema. Juvenile forefoot eczema we're not seeing so much recently. I'll have a little chat about that, but, uh, but not a lot. Stasis eczema, uh, we're seeing more and more of that in the elderly. So you need to do a little bit of reading on that topic. The big thing to watch with stasis dermatitis is that uh, I think 30 to 40 percent of them have a significant associated contact dermatitis, contact allergic dermatitis from preparations that they've been applying. The crux, by the way, are these graded elastic compression stockings. Um, Lichen simplex chronicus. You can see that in a variety of different sites, particularly the nape of the neck, the lower leg, the uh, buttock cleft. It's important to be able to recognize it, that lichenification, that thickening of the skin. It may look very like psoriasis. Sometimes it can look like a skin cancer. But the accentuation of the skin markings uh, is a factor that should prompt you to uh, make that diagnosis. Patch testing is a major topic. 
uh, I think you should have a basic knowledge, obviously, of uh, patch testing. It's an art that you have to learn. The best way of learning it is, in fact, sitting with a, an expert, taking the, seeing the patient first, taking a history, working out um, whether you think a contact irritant or contact allergic dermatitis is likely, or a combination of both, which is often common, and working out what you think the likely allergens uh, would be and what to test them for. The, we'll, in the webinar itself, we'll go over some of the major allergens that occur at certain sites uh, on the body. We've often asked what's the commonest allergen out there. Now, certainly in patch testing, um, the commonest one we usually see is nickel. And it's usually in women, and it's primarily because they're getting their ears pierced. But I think overall, and I remember seeing a statistic that in the States, 60 to 70 percent of people um, are in fact show positive allergic reactions to roost dermatitis, to the roost tree. We don't have such a high figure here, obviously, in Australia, but it's obviously a very significant allergen in, uh, in the United States. Contact urticaria, <coughs> again, is a topic that you need to know something about. You'll see it particularly in... Um, food handlers when it's a chronic, um, uh, when it's a contact allergic reaction and it's usually uh, an immediate hypersensitive reaction, it's IgE maybe. But you can have chemical <coughs> contact urticarias as well. There are certain substances that are in creams that are capable of releasing histamine in the skin as well and it's partly responsible for the itch or irritation that some patients get when they apply certain creams to their face. And of course that comes on within you know, 10 to 15 minutes. So you can get a chemical contact urticaria as well as an allergic contact urticaria. The allergic one is usually um, type 1 reactions due to uh, reaction to a food protein. So it's particularly common in chefs and food handlers. Perfume allergies you should know a bit about because they're so ubiquitous. Um, perfumes used all over the place. We'll chat a bit more about that during the... Um, webinar itself. So, what else? This was a, a good little video, I think. It was mainly on uh, aspects of irritant and allergic contact dermatitis and the main differences between them. So you should have a, a listen to that if you've got time. We'll then go on and look at our dermatoscopy topic. Now, it's going to be in vessels. I'll get out some images of the various types of vessels and how you should um, approach them or what their inference is. The vessels that you see with tumours really relate to how rapidly they grow um, and where they sit in relation to the superficial and the deep dermal practice of, uh, of uh, vessels. Any rapidly growing tumour is going to have um, some looped vessels associated uh, with it. And that's just because of the way it grows and stretches that uh, upper dermal um, vascular plexus. But there are certainly certain patterns of vessels that are important, particularly in diagnosing BCCs, differentiating them from um, dermal nevi, uh, differentiating a superficial BCC from uh, an SCC in situ, and other lesions such as clear cell acanthoma, which uh, appear to give um, uh, small dot vessels associated, um, well, vit virtually running in lines, we call it a string of pearl sign. Um, dot vessels are also quite common. They're common in the lower legs and in a variety of inflammatory skin conditions, particularly psoriasis. But dot vessels associated with a variety of other vessels is, are also a feature of melanoma. So we'll try and show some amelanotic melanomas just to bring that point out. There's a good video there, by the way, on Kettlerian vessel terminology, and I think it's uh, worthwhile having a, a look at that one. I'll list this one up as uh, one of the videos that you should do in the summary section of this module. Other things we may have time to talk about in dermatoscopy are pseudo-networks both the inverse network and um, the pseudo-network that you see in the face, which is due to the openings of the, of the hair follicles rather than the deposition of 
um, melanin in nevus and melanocytes along the sides of retinal ridges, which is the normal sort of network uh, cause of the, uh, of the network pattern that you see. Um, we also may have time to look at some of these other structures and patterns as seen by Harold Kittler, where we're going to get away from just using descriptive terms, um, morphological terms to describe structures and try and get it in terms of lines, in terms of uh, circles, in terms of dots and clods. Lesions in the gums, if we've got time, we'll have a look at some of these. Um, giant cell granulomas, peripheral ossifying fibromas, epilis and pyogenic granulomas. The topical antibacterials, we, we'll see um, if, if you'd like me to go over those. We'll probably discuss a little bit about them. They're obviously important in dermatology. But I think perhaps we're trying a little bit too much in this particular um, module. Depends how much reading you've uh, done on this. I'll try and be a bit selective and just go over certain things, but I reckon we're going to have our, uh, an hour and a half well filled looking at, uh, at all these topics. So, if I can give you a bit of advice beforehand, try listening to this lecture on hand dermatitis by Joe Fowler. It really is very good. Have a little look at um, this video here that will describe some of the lesions, uh, some of the clinical images that uh, are in this, uh, this particular module. And if you've got time, try and have a look at some of the dermatoscopy uh, lesions as well, especially the bits on vessels. Thank you very much.